Juno meets Psycho in Jennifer's Body. Or is it more like Mean Girls meet the meanest girl ever? Also coming up this week at the movies. Where are we going? It's fun not knowing, isn't it? Can Jennifer Aniston and Aaron Eckhart improve the miserable state of romantic comedies? We'll review Love Happens. You are about to be crushed by a giant corn. And it's raining dinner. The forecast is cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I get anxious if I don't see her. When I don't hear from him, it's as if I've died. Plus, it's porno for English majors. We'll review Jane Campion's Bright Star. How could I ever be insecure? I was the snowflake queen. Yeah. Two years ago, when you were socially relevant. I am still socially relevant. And when you didn't need laxatives to stay skinny. I am going to eat your soul. I thought you only murdered boys. I go both ways. I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm A.O. Scott of the New York Times. From cat people to Carrie and beyond, anxiety about female sexuality has fueled the horror movie genre. Much of the time, that anxiety is explored by men. But Jennifer's body, with Megan Fox as a high school mean girl possessed by a demon, tackles the subject from a frankly, if somewhat ambiguously, feminist point of view. Which is not to say that the guys in this movie don't have reason to be scared. This isn't really your house, is it? No, baby. This is our house. Just for you and me. You can play mommy and daddy. No way. Jennifer's Body was directed by Karen Kusama, whose debut film was the tough and tender girl fight. The screenwriter is Diablo Cody, author of Juno, and her hallmark idiom of punning self-conscious teen speak is on display throughout Jennifer's Body, sometimes to distracting effect. They took her in their spooky van with the windows all blacked out. Did you get the make and model? I don't know, Chip, an 89 rapist? She's still in there. We have to go find her. People just burned to death. Is there somebody here? There's certainly problems with this movie beyond the abrasive Diabloism. Jennifer's pre-demonic personality isn't well enough established, and some of the fright scenes are mishandled. But Amanda Seyfried is terrific as Needy, Jennifer's unlikely best friend and the real protagonist of the film. Needy and Jennifer are rivals, confidants, and perhaps something more as well. I couldn't bring myself to hurt you. I mean, I'm a really good friend. Leave. Come on, Needy, let me stay the night. We can play boyfriend-girlfriend like we used to. I'm not gonna bite you. As I've said, this movie has its flaws, and it's likely to get kicked around by some critics, not naming any names. But I think it has real integrity, and also a good chance at becoming something of a teenage cult favorite. So I say, see it. Now, Tony, you're reviewing the film that you wish you had seen. I, this is a big disappointment. I, I think Diablo yeah. Cody's, you know, big talent coming off Juno, which I liked a lot more than a lot of people, and I didn't find the dialogue, you know, uh, distractingly arch. I just thought it was very clever. And here, I just feel like she's never really found the voice, she's, as you've already identified, among many of the problems you already identify with the picture, <laughs> and yet mysteriously defending it. I think, you know, she's never figured out how to make Jennifer anything more than just sort of a well, but, horror movie trope. And I got to say one thing, Megan. Fox, you know, look, one of the worst actresses in Hollywood. But the movie's not about Jennifer. Excuse me. It's uh, not about Jennifer. It's Jennifer's, it's Jennifer's body. It's not Jennifer's soul. The soul of the movie belongs to Amanda Seyfried, who's wonderful. She is good. And she that is good. character is a really interesting take on a, a teenage girl in, in crisis. And I think she does that at, as she did in the show Big Love in a way that's surprising and yeah. unusual. And I think the movie goes to some very interesting places. It's not always in control of itself or of its themes, but I think it has a lot to say. But you're making it sound a lot more stimulating than it is, because I just think it's really kind of watery. And, and look, this is this is an action sequence coming up here, it's climax of the film, uh -huh. and this director does not know which way to play it. Why don't you just come here and kiss me again? I don't know. I, I thought that scene was kind of beautiful in a strange and haunting way. And I think there's a lot in this movie that's that's sort of interesting and offbeat and a little messy, but but fascinating. It reminded me of uh, of another movie, a, a kind of a teenage movie that was passed over by a lot of critics, but that held on to a cult that grew over the year, which was Donnie Darko. A much more interesting film that one. This this film, Jennifer's Body, only goes halfway towards satire, halfway sincere. And look, Megan Fox, you're dismissive of the problem that is. <laughs> 
Fox, and there are 500 actresses in Hollywood who could have and probably should have played that part. I say skip it. Next up, guy walks into a bar. He's blind. He's played by Stanley Tucci, and the movie is called Blind Date. Will you marry me? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Why? Don't you like me? I like you. I think you're gorgeous. And well, how can you tell? Oh, come on. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh my God. Oh, yes. No, I was right. That seems one of a dozen or so charades enacted by the same married couple, Don, played by Tucci, and Jana, played by the equally strong Patricia Clarkson. The film's an adaptation of Dutch director Theo van Gogh's 1996 drama. It's more like a play or a series of theater games than a movie. One minute, the husband and wife are tango dancers looking for a little action. I think I told you I'm married. Yes, you mentioned. I would never do anything to hurt my wife. I, I'm not looking for I know, any... I know. I only want a dancing partner, nothing okay. more. Right, I understand. The next, Don's a reporter interviewing a woman with a well-advertised grudge and a mean sucker punch. I wish Blind Date, which director Tucci shot a couple of years ago, had that kind of gut impact. Behind all the role-playing is a movie that feels uncertain in its tone and style, more exercise than drama, I'd say. So, regrettably, I say skip it. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting and worthy project. Theo van Gogh was a Dutch filmmaker who was murdered by a Muslim extremist a few years ago. And this is the second feature film, English language feature film, that's been remade from one of his Dutch films. The first was Interview that starred uh, Steve Buscemi and, and Sienna Miller. Which was a lot more engaging, I thought. And oh, it really yes. felt like it, it was his it own movie, you know, it wasn't just an adaptation. Mm. And this one, yeah, it does feel very stage-bound, very formal, much more, as you say, like an acting exercise than like a full-fledged motion picture. Even though, you know, Stanley Tucci and Patricia Clarkson are, are of course, wonderful actors. Yes, but I have to agree, skip this one. And coming up next, it's Sex Sexless in Seattle. Jennifer Aniston and Aaron Eckhart star in Love Happens. And later, the sexiest couple of the year, the year 1819, that is, in Bright Star. She wants to read it by herself to see if he's an idiot or not. How long have you been at this? Oh, I finally got up the guts a couple years ago to open my own shop. May I just point out, now you're dating some guy who's not even going to be in town for 72 hours? I like him. One thing I will say about Jennifer Aniston and Aaron Eckhart, they both have really nice chins. Also, matching blue eyes and sandy blonde hair. They're good-looking people. But of course, I knew that going into Love Happens, and it's pretty much all I was left with. Aniston plays Eloise, a Seattle florist, a little flaky, kind of mischievous, but wise underneath it all, in that Jennifer Aniston way. Aaron Eckhart is Burke Ryan, a self-help guru in town to give a seminar based on his bestseller, A-OK. -okay. Their early encounters, though, are not so okay. Would you like to have a cup of coffee? Uh, I'm sorry, I... I... You... A lot of classic romantic comedies begin with hostility that eventually blossoms into love. And just about every modern romantic comedy features Judy Greer as the heroine's wacky friend. So why should this one be any different? At some point, we are going to be standing here having the same conversation again, and you're going to be shocked at the outcome of the relationship again. But most of all, I just hate seeing you get so disappointed and hurt every single time. Love Happens isn't really a romantic comedy, in spite of a few scenes that I think were meant to be amusing. Like just about every other man in Hollywood romances these days, Burke is a widower, and Eloise is on hand to help him through his grief. And, and this comes from a place of total humility, with the acknowledgement that my life is a day-by-day -day experiment in really bad decisions but uh, you really messed up <laughs> love happens is as lazy and offhand as its title and as far as any chemistry between aniston and eckhart is concerned nothing happens <laughs> skip it tony later in the show we're going to talk about romantic comedies that actually do mean something to us this will not be one of them uh no and uh, the only thing that got me through this is john carroll lynch great character actor who was in everything from zodiac yeah. to fargo yeah. as one of the grief counseled uh, uh customers and he brings such gravity and such emotional sincerity and such a 
real rich performance to this movie that you think, what's he doing here? Yeah, he's what is he doing? He's what is he doing with these, with, yeah. with these two ciphers? You yeah, know, with yeah. this like dimple chin Aaron Eckhart going around, you know, <laughs> boo hoo, my wife is dead, everyone feel a okay, walk on coals, whatever else he's doing. And, and Jennifer Aniston, who is just barely a character at all, she's like a few little mannerisms. She writes big, strange words on the walls of the hotel. Yeah, she has a flower <laughs> store. You, she yeah. kind of has a zany van. But, yeah. I mean, who is she supposed to be? And why do they love each other? You would have no, you'd have no idea, other? too, that Aniston has, has got anything to offer. And she's no. so good in little movies like The Good Girls. Yes, and here she's got nothing to play. I say skip it. Coming up next, based on the best-selling children's book, it's cloudy with a chance of meatballs. And on next week's show, Michael Moore tries to unravel our economic woes in capitalism, a love story. Plus, life is all about singing and dancing for the kids of fame. You've got talent. Let's see what we can do with it. From a whimsical 30-page picture book comes the latest 3D attempt in animation to shred your kid's attention span into tiny little pieces. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs takes us to an island in the Atlantic where Flint Lockwood, voiced by Bill Hader, grows up with inventions on his mind. I was determined to invent something great. Remote control television! <laughs> Years later, he retools a machine that turns water into food, all kinds of food. The sky rains hamburgers, ice cream, whatever Flint or the greedy mare, voiced by Bruce Campbell, feeds into the computer. But it all goes fluey, and the film turns into a mini disaster movie, The Day After Tomorrow, with an all-you-can-eat menu. The machine has a mind of its own. We are about to be in the epicenter of a perfect food storm. So it's awfully manic. Is it funny? It is actually. Sometimes the writers do know how to set up a running gag and, well, run with it. And the movie has that basic hook of enormous pancakes and truck sized hot dogs going for it. But the final third of Meatballs, which presents yet another end of the world scenario, we've seen a lot of those lately, is just plain exhausting. You want charm? Go back to the book. Still, this film lands in the middle, I'd say, of the spectrum of this year's animated features. So for me, that makes it a rent it. My kid, who's almost nine, may tell you otherwise. Well, you know, we're in the middle of a very serious epidemic of obesity. And I think it's very <laughs> irresponsible for these filmmakers to put out a movie that features giant food falling yes, out of the yes. sky and people eating until they get sick. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, this, this movie... I respect that there was some ingenuity and creativity that went into those 3D giant sized meatballs. Although some of the other food, the, the right. shrimp and the candy corn was more interesting. Macaroni. But it just, I just found it sickening and sickening. hard to sit through. It just, <laughs> and you're right, I mean the end, whatever slight charm it may have had yeah. is gone by the end, which is just sort of, you know. It's a big, it's a definitely a, a bigger a is better kind of yeah. It's yeah. the same kind of aesthetic you might have got with Monsters vs. Aliens, you know, which is a film I actually like less than this one. but. You know, I'd say still, it's a rent it for me. For me, this movie was just too noisy, too overstuffed, too gross. So I say, skip it. And now we can change gears completely. <laughs> Beginning in April of 1819, John Keats and Fanny Braun lived in adjoining halves of a house in Hampstead, North London. No meatballs there. Over the next nine months, as their love blossomed, Keats wrote the poems that would establish him as one of the great figures of English literature. The following year, suffering from tuberculosis, he traveled to Italy, and shortly thereafter, at the age of 25, he died. This short span of a tragically short life is the focus of Jane Campion's bright star. I almost wish we were butterflies and lived but three summer days. Three such days with you I could fill with more delight than 50 common years could ever contain. It begins when Fanny and John first meet, and it follows the biographical record closely. But it's hardly a conventional biopic. And even though the period clothes recall countless Jane Austen adaptations, Bright Star is not a standard costume drama either. It's a swooning, intense anatomy of thwarted sexual passion and half-fulfilled literary ambition. I had such a dream last night. I was floating above the trees with my lips connected to those of a beautiful figure. Whose lips? Were they my lips? Keats, as played by Ben Wishaw, is sometimes almost a caricature of a sickly, skinny poet. 
But the movie really belongs to Fanny, who's played by the wonderful Australian actress Abby Cornish, as a volatile mixture of reckless desire and stubborn good sense. When I don't hear from him, it's as if I've died. As if the air is sucked out from my lungs. And I'm left desolate, but when I receive a letter, I know our world is real. The one I care for. The story does get a bit repetitive, but the performances are so alive and the filmmaking is so full of vitality and intelligence that I didn't really mind. Wishaw and Cornish barely touch and never disrobe, but the sexual charge between them is palpable and feverish. To quote Keats, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. See this movie. Yeah, I'm with you on Cornish. She is terrific. She's probably going to get an Oscar nomination, I, I think. But i got to say, this, to me, felt insufferably exquisite. And I just think for Jane Campion, it's a big come down. The, the films of hers I really responded to, Tony, were much wilder and much more stylistically out there, like a film like The Portrait of a Lady, even The Piano. This one, to me, just felt very kind of cautious and well-behaved and really less of a directorial personality going on behind the camera. That's Mr. Phillips, it is critics like you who put John Keats in his grave. <laughs> and I disagree with you I got that completely. in my head now? Yeah, well, it was, his friend said it was the critics that killed him. Just, okay. you know, just, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I actually don't agree. I think that there's a lot of, of vitality in this movie. I, I don't feel, this didn't feel to me like one of these period movies where the character are embalmed in this distant past. Mm. They felt very alive in their own present. I thought the camera work was very, very sort of agitated now and, and then. interesting. Now and then. There's a lot of sarcasm. There's a lot of feeling, even though the behavior in this movie is often very decorous and proper. It's also a very raw and I think very rough movie. I'd say really raw, really rough in kind of a really placid, really well-behaved way. I don't know. If it weren't for Abby Cornish, I don't know if this film would be worth seeing at all, but because of her, I say rent it. Coming up next, more love. Tony and I give you our picks for our favorite romantic comedy. I think I like this, man. Hello. Now it's time for our DVD Out Now segment. We're always ragging on the woeful state of the romantic comedy, but anyone with a little curiosity can plunge back into film history and come up with all sorts of riches. One of my favorites in this loosely defined genre is the 1938 George Cukor picture, Holiday, based on Philip Berry's play, about the young stockbroker who falls in love with his fiancée's sister. Now check out the way Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn handle this delicious New Year's Eve sequence. You wouldn't care to step into a waltz as the old year dies, would you, Mr. Case? Yes, I would. I'd love it. My favorite screen couple from this era, Tony, is always going to be Grant and Rosalind Russell and His Girl Friday, but Holiday is another more delicate thing altogether, a terrific film. Indeed it is, and uh, my film is from the same era. I don't know about you, but when I think about Budapest, I think of Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> I'm serious. One of my favorite movies on my short list for the most romantic film ever made is Shop Around the Corner, in which Stewart, that all-American boy, plays, of all things, a Hungarian retail clerk. And why not? Margaret Sullivan, who plays the co-worker for whom he nurses an unacknowledged flame, doesn't seem especially Hungarian either. But this is part of the charm of classical Hollywood. Shop Around the Corner, which follows an accelerating romance in the middle of the Christmas holiday shopping rush, is simple yet busy, sentimental yet wise. It's an almost perfect movie. Oh, fantastic. And talk about an amazing mixture of tones and a romance you really believe in. Yeah. Now, the remake, one of the remakes, You've Got Mail, not as good, but if, you did, if you did like it, you might as well go Go back and really compare it to Shop Around the Yeah, well, and in both of these movies, and in so many comedies from this era, there's such elegance and such style and such real feeling as yeah, well. Yeah, that's great. So, both Holiday and The Shop Around the Corner are available on DVD right now, and The Shop Around the Corner will be out in a special collection on November 3rd. We'll continue this discussion of our favorite romantic comedies in an online exclusive. Just go to atthemoviestv.com. Coming up next, want to know what you can't miss this weekend? Stay tuned for my three to see. need me to run the company. That's completely illogical. Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by... I know what 10 plus 10 is. 15. Want to feel really smart? Call today about our back-to-school special. Call 1-800-STEAMER. Stanley Steamer gets carpet cleaner. Ever wonder what it would be like to see Toy Story and Toy Story 2 in 3D? Woo! On October 2nd, it's coming. Let's move, move, move! The ultimate Toy Story 3D double feature. Ah! 
My eyeballs could have been sucked from their sockets. One ticket for Disney Pixar's Toy Story and Toy Story 2. All right. Together in Disney Digital 3D. We love you! Only in theaters for a two-week limited engagement. Ready G. Take Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. Now it's time for my three to see. At number three is the Bader Meinhof Complex, which we reviewed last week. It's a vivid, intense investigation of left-wing terrorism in Germany in the 1970s. Some terrific performances. Number two is Bright Star, which we just talked about. Jane Campion's smart and lively anatomy of poetic passion in Regency England. And number one, Steven Soderbergh's The Informant, a nicely offbeat comedy with Matt Damon as a whistleblower who may be almost as rotten as the corporate criminals he's trying to bring down. Okay, that's it for now. Remember, we're always online. Just go to atthemoviestv.com. We'll leave you with a recap of this week's show. Join us next week when we'll review Michael Moore's controversial documentary, Capitalism, A Love Story. Plus, we'll review a remake of Fame. And until then, we'll be at the movies.